identify yourself within the first five seconds, um, or else we might have to re-roll the price. So remember, just one uh, business card purpose. We have uh, a few more patients that we have everyone registered. So. <laughs> Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Vice Chancellor, the Director, and all the uh, course participants, and of course the various speakers. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it was uh, uh, very interesting for me because when I uh, was given the invitation and I saw the program, uh, it's titled National Conference on Information Technology. Uh, but if you actually see the program itself, it's more than information technology, it's more to do with ICT. Uh, for those of you who may not necessarily be familiar, if you take a quick, quick glance of what is the definition of IT or information technology, it refers to anything related to computing technology such as networking, hardware and software and is usually considered a subset in fact of ICT. So ICT of course refers to technology that provide access to information through telecommunications. It is focused on communication technology such as internet, wireless networks, cell phones and other communication mediums. So overall, what we are here talking about and looking at the list of speakers, we're talking overall about the ICT sector. And indeed, uh, it is very, very critically important, in particular for a country like Fiji, because access to technology, uh, for example, generally speaking now, is made available more through broadband access. So a lot of people, for example, accessing internet now today is through mobile broadband. And what we have done, you will see as the VC highlighted, is a mixture of technologies that have been used. There's a mixture of fronts that we are addressing in respect of trying to build the capacity. The Vice Chancellor is absolutely right. Um, if we want to actually uh, position ourselves for the 21st century, uh, it's not only about you know, getting your roads and bridges uh, and airports built. It's also about building your ICT capacity because otherwise we will get left behind. And to be frank, uh, when we did an assessment of this, we were quite astounded as to how there was very little planning 10, 15, 20 years ago, because these things need to be all planned out. So we embarked on some major reforms, uh, including things such as the, uh, the reconfiguration or reallocation of things like frequencies. So if you look at television, for example, in Fiji, you know, you have UHF, you have VHF. And this is what we call limited real estate. Frequency is limited real estate. If you want to, for example, get into 4G technology, if you want to now, people are talking about the next uh, one, you know, 5G or LTE, etc. You need to ensure that the re limited real estate or frequency that you have you actually are able to dish it out, give it out in a manner that is sustainable. Otherwise, you limit yourself. Very basic example. So somebody would come and ask for, for example, a community radio station. So then the communications department used to previously give the entire sort of national frequency to them. You don't do that because it's limited. It's a lack of understanding in that respect. So we rationalized it, we brought in the experts, we brought in ITU, International Telecommunications Union, to actually help us reconfigure the frequency. So you saw when we actually now had the 4G technology brought in with mobile, uh, mobile phones, we actually had a uh, open tender process. We had a running tender process. So those of you, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, when we actually called for tenders on that, if you sat outside Super Bowl House, Every hour you had different frequencies being sold or tendered for at different pricing. And in fact, if you look at many countries in the world, some major countries in the world, where mobile phone connectivity is something like 10 million a month, enormous levels of corruption took place because the inability of the governments to be able to rationalize the frequencies. Because it is these fundamental issues that need to be addressed. Otherwise, your way forward regarding technology or access to technology and making a lot more equal uh, won't be achieved. And so, you know, what the VC highlighted earlier on is a very critical point. Many people have said that technology can be the greatest equalizer 
amongst people. But as we've repeatedly said, it can become the greatest e disequalizer if you do not ensure that everybody has access to it. So why should students, high school students for example, sitting in Suva, have access to all this wonderful technology, whereas a child going to some high school in Kandavu or primary school in Kandavu around some cove where there is absolutely no connectivity, not have access to that technology. You're creating a bigger divide, not just in terms of the isolation, but now creating a technological isolation. So we have to be extremely mindful of that. So these are very important considerations. Government recently um, invested over $12 million, as provided for in the budget, past couple of budgets ago, uh, for laying of the submarine cable from, um, from Suva, of course. In technically, it's not that. As you know, let me just give you a bit of brief. As you know that Fiji has, uh, very fortunate, fortunately, we have the Southern Cross cable that lands in Batwanda. Now, this connects Australia to the west coast of North America, through Hawaii to the west coast of North America. So, anybody that wants to connect to the submarine cable, which is called the Southern Cross Cable, they need to actually, any of the other Pacific Island countries, they come to Batwanda. So, Samoa was building a cable, funding by, funded by World Bank, etc., that wanted to come to Suva, or Batwanda, to get connected. This submarine cable had to pass between Tavuni and Samsam. So we saw an opportunity. So what we immediately did was jump on that and build a pipe out of that cable to land into Samsam. Cost us $12 million, in fact a bit more than that. Now what that means is the landing of that cable, there is no longer microwave linkages from Viti Levu to Vanua Levu. So Vodafone, etc., Digicel, used to connect from Suva to Vanuelu through microwave linkages. And those of you who know a little bit about that would know that microwave connectivity does not travel very well over water. So that's why you have very low uh, broadband, very low rates of connectivity, a lot of fallouts or dropouts. So with the landing of that cable now in Savu the people in Vanuelu, the people in Tavuni, will immediately get an almost 100%, if not more, bigger broadband. 100% in terms of connectivity, increase. So, because again, like I said, we don't want to see a divide between Viti Levu and Vanu Levu. We don't want people from Vanu Levu to come to Viti Levu so they can get a better mobile phone connectivity. There's already too many of them in Suva. We want people to stay in Vanu Levu. In fact, we want people from Viti Levu to go to Vanu Levu. A lot of real estate. Great opportunities. But that's a hardcore reality. Today, 50% of our population is below the age of 27. Most of you are not in that category I see in this room. Most of you, in fact, I see are probably over the age of 35 in this room. 50% of the population is below the age of 27. What do they want? What are their prime considerations in life? I get a lot of complaints about people saying, or used to get a lot more, you know, for me to get a signal, I have to go and hang off that coconut tree. These things are important for some people. Getting the level of connectivity, getting the level of access to internet connectivity. So, as a government, we need to create the right environment to ensure that there is a huge uptake of technology. We are spending over $40 million overall in the ICT sector in this year's budget. Whether it's creating Wi-Fi hotspots at all FNU campuses. We are investing in FNU because we believe it is the National University of Fiji. It's completely government funded. And we need to bring it up to a particular level where it becomes a lot more attractive. As you know, some countries like, for example, Singapore is done. Started off as a small university, now the National University of Singapore is world acclaimed. We believe FNU has the potential to be in that space, at least reasonably speaking, and beyond that. We've got public Wi-Fi hotspots now, we've got the various parks in Fiji. 
And the reason why we're investing in those places is because we want more and more people to have an uptake of technology. Still a lot of people don't like to use phones. Or they only see phones as a means of verbally communicating. Not necessarily accessing data or information, communicating information or data to each other. We have over 500,000 Facebook users in Fiji. Of course, one may argue that the quality of information on Facebook is not very you know, attractive. And unfortunately, that's something that we need to look at also, to set up online safety commissions, etc. But this wonderful usage of technology, I'm very also you know, uh, uh, happy to announce, and you would know that uh, this has been talked about in the public space, that we have now you know, engaged with the Singapore uh, Cooperation Enterprise, which is a four-year program. And let me highlight to you some of the things that we've done. And through this uh, SCE, uh, we are going to implement a number of government uh, applications to enhance the overall ICT uh, infrastructure and build, and build and develop capacity in digital transformation in the government. We've already launched Digital Fiji. I was hoping that the logo would go up at uh, some point, uh, but it hasn't, but I'll show you. Uh, Digital Fiji um, has uh, launched a number of applications. We make, for example, we've got a government directory that's available uh, on smart devices such as mobile phones and tablets. Since the launch, there's been 130 visits a day, and this number is gradually increasing as more and more people get to know about it. So this, for example, gives you phone numbers of uh, ministers, permanent secretaries, directors, everybody else, where ministries are located, very basic things like that. And uh, we also have uh, uh, an app to communicate, communicate your complaints and feedback directly to government. And then there's a tracking system that tracks the status of the feedback while they await a response. Uh, since the launch, uh, which was done uh, only uh, last year, we've received over 300 feedback and of that 70% uh, of the complaints that were launched have been resolved within a short of, uh, time frame compared to when correspondence were actually hand delivered. You know, I have t people till today saying, I'm going to complain, uh, I'm going to catch the boat and come down and see the ministry. So imagine the the loss of productivity the person has to get on the boat, if they live in Lambasa, or beyond that, then they catch the bus from Lambasa to go to Nambawalu, then they catch the ferry, and they come to Natobi, then they catch the bus, and they come to Suva, and they sit outside the ministry, maybe they'll get to see the person, maybe they won't get to see the person. Now they can actually lodge their complaints directly on the app. But of course, we have to ensure that they have connectivity, mobile phone connecti connectivity. Digicel, uh, sorry, Vodafone, I should say, has announced uh, last year uh, over $200 million expansion. Currently, there's a lot of complaints about dropouts, about uh, black spots, about brown spots. Now, um, Vodafone, we... I re just last night, in fact, I had a discussion with the, the CEO of Vodafone and we expect most of the upgrades to be actually completed by June, July of this year. It's a huge expansion. Uh, it will also fix up those the blackout spots and brownouts and also be able to expand into new areas where currently they don't have level of connectivity. And of course, now with Wilesi coming on and the OTT, you know, people now watch rugby on their mobile phones. It was very interesting when we launched it, the Wilesi and the OTT on the, on the mobile phones. Uh, I remember soon thereafter it, uh, the World Football World Cup took place and I was, uh, I was in Vanuatu and I was getting on the plane and at the airport this taxi driver came up to me and he said, oh no, thank you very much for the OTT. He said, because I can watch all my games whilst I'm waiting for my customers here at the airport. Now, apart from the fact that you've got a very happy person who can watch his football, uh, it's creating jobs, it's creating income, it's creating tax revenue for us. Because Vodafone is making money, they're going to pay us a lot more tax. What do we do with the tax? We spend the money to create more facilities in Fiji. So you see, this is the linkages that people actually need to realize uh, that it's, uh, it's creating. Now, we're also uh, developing uh, a individual e-profiles for all citizens in Fiji. It's slow, it's laborious, 
uh, but we will get there. Currently, there's about f over 40,000 people who can now go on the e-profile without actually having to physically come in to register because FNPF and FRCS, or FOCUS as we call them, now are able to say and verify that these 40,000 odd people are the same people. The IDs are checked out. So we can actually, they can go online and get access to this e-profile. Because what uh, the um, uh, SCE is doing for us, we're also streamlining the process of a number of agencies such as BDM, a company's office. A few years ago, we did a sweep around Fiji of all the people who did not have birth certificates. There are over, at one point in time, 25,000 people we found in one sweep that did not have birth certificates. Some people as old as 55 years old. There's some people who are 65 years old who did not have a birth certificate. Most of you in this room cannot imagine a life without a birth certificate. So, if you do not have proper identification processes, then it makes it a lot more difficult to do, for example, national planning, government planning. How many people are below a particular income level? How do we get services out to them? That's digital fee, sorry, that's uh, up there. How do we get access to ser uh, access of services to them? How do we better plan? <coughs> so it's very important for us to do that. So we will now um, uh, carry out your ability. People can now register babies or get the information on their mobile phones. So when a mother gives birth, normally the hospital, for example, gives you the, the birth time, the mother, the father's name, etc., which you then take to the BDM office to register the baby. You get a birth certificate, that's when you decide on a name, give a name, etc. Now you can actually do that on your phone. You then submit it. And in that, they'll ask you, what time will you come to pick up your birth certificate? When I told that to somebody, said, it's unbelievable. Now we're making appointments to go and see a government department. So you can say, at 10.30 a.m., I'll come and pick up my daughter's birth certificate. Hopefully, in about nine months' time, you'll be able to pay online. And what we're talking to SCE, SCE now is that perhaps in about 18 months' time, you'll get an e-birth certificate. So when you go to school, to register your child or enroll your child, you simply tap it on the machine. Every year, since 2007, that's how long I've been there, and I know, Minister of Justice, what happens. Before school starts, you literally have thousands of people coming in to get a birth certificate for their child because they have not registered their baby or the child. So we now open up the BDM office late into the evening on Saturdays, pay overtime, get more resources. Once you're able to register people online, you're able to access the documents online, we don't have to do that. And of course, one other important thing which is very important, and this is access to technology, and the government this year has also announced the usage of, of subsidizing POS machines, point of sale machines. It's very important to understand this. At the moment you go to the shop, if I, sorry, let me see, if I go to a shop in New Zealand, that bottle of water I can buy with my ATM card, my ATM card I can buy. In Fiji they say minimum purchase $10. Now when people actually buy goods and services using the ATM card, it means the money stays within the cash system. It means the money is not physically drawn out of the banking system. So if all of you pay each other, buy services from each other using electronic means, so it gets transferred from one account to the other account to the other account, the cash does not go out. So your liquidity is high. At the moment, of course, some people are talking about liquidity without knowing anything about it. But liquidity remains high. When liquidity remains high within the banking system, it means the cost of funds comes down. So when you go to borrow money, the interest rate is less. That's one of the advantages of having more electronic transactions. So we are, for example, saying the ordinary shops, the mom and dad shops around the corner where you can buy your bread, etc., they should have point of sale machines also. So instead of you having to carry your cash, you simply take your ATM card. So what happens? The shopkeeper does not have to go to the bank to bank the money. The money is already banked when you carry out the sale. 
with e-ticketing. Not many people realize with bus companies, everybody paying $2.50, $1.50, they collect the coins and they physically have to count it and take it to the bank and they stand in the bank in the queue and the teller counts all the money and everybody else waits. Now the banks, the bus companies don't bank money. It's already banked for them when you pay through your e-ticketing card. We also know how much money they make. <laughs> Which is good. Low tax rate. But you see, that's the advantage. And people don't understand what we have done. Why have we created an only 20% tax rate? Today, if you earn less than $30,000, you don't pay any taxes. Not a single cent of tax is paid. If you're a company, you pay only 20% corporate tax rate. So there's no need to steal. Some still do, but there's no need to steal. The reality is that the business environment is becoming a lot better from that perspective. Um, we have also, you know, when ICT develops, of course, we have, uh, it creates jobs, new set of jobs. With SCE, we now got an internship scheme. We see, I have to say, that when SCE, SCE team got in touch with your people who look after interns, they weren't very hungry, so only university responded was USP. So SCE has already got uh, three interns from USP, the students, so we hope that your people will respond to that. Um, we've also, one thing which is really interesting too, is with, with SCE we've got them, this world-renowned architect and town planner uh, from Singapore, he's in his late 70s, early 80s, Dr. Liu, we've got him to look at our urban planning, creating smarter and cleaner cities. That's very important, how we use technologies in our towns and cities. And uh, we've got some, uh, they're going to roll out some plans for us so we can have a planned program towards the development of our urban centers uh, for the next 50 years. Of course, you know, things like ease of doing business does help. ICT, of course, is wonderful, but it also presents a number of issues. Apart from things like, uh, we've got the Online Safety Commissioner and Dunn looking at issues such as, you know, pornography, uh, we've had a number of issues. I mean, uh, the story that I've told uh, quite a few times now, we've had people, for example, who stuck cameras as one particular person, and generally females and children are the victims of this, uh, where somebody stuck a camera in the room, and as you would do in your room, you change your clothes, you do whatever you do in the privacy of your own home, that was being live streamed. Being live streamed. Pictures were taken online, live streamed, and being sold online. These are hardcore realities. Uh, we have, of course, cybercrime. You can have cyber attacks. And generally, it's in the financial systems. I remember some months back in Australia, the entire uh, client files, you know, patients' files were revealed online. So those are also issues. Again, we need to build that capacity in our own people to be able to address that. People who can have a deep understanding and knowledge of the technology. So, uh, in fact, uh, the Ministry of Communications also, in partnership with the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization, of which uh, the, uh, as the VC highlighted with the current chair, we drafted Fiji's first national cyber security strategy, uh, comparing, uh, you know, after various consultation stakeholders in 2016. Um, and again, uh, we've got, as I said, the number of internet users, etc. Uh, you'd have seen some recent uh, uh, material that's come out, I think it's called Momo. You see with the children's uh, apps, whether, you know, uh, the uh, uh, various programs they watch and this thing comes up. Some people, so children have actually harmed themselves. Um, now, of course, we have a focus on uh, cyber security solutions, national cyber security solutions and alignment to evolving standards uh, through international cooperation with global network of what we call computer emergency readiness teams or CERT uh, such as the Asia Pacific CERT and of course we have what we call FIRST the Forum for Incident Response and Security, security Teams On Tuesday only a cabinet endorsed for the Ministry of Communications to take all necessary steps and procedures to establish a national computer readiness team and formulate comprehensive cybercrime legislation to enable Fiji to accede to the Council of European of Europe Convention on Cybercrime, 
commonly known as the Budapest Convention. And please, you need to know about the Budapest, Budapest Convention. And we are quite keen to sign up to the Budapest Convention to enable Fiji to deal with new dimensions of cybercrime through effective international cooperation, mutual legal assistance, and capacity building. Uh, we have, of course, ladies and gentlemen, you know, uh, with technology uh, changing, we need to be able to expand our, not just our individual minds, but also companies need to adjust. Um, you know, we have, we talked about online shopping, a new supermarket is open, I forget the name exactly, but you know, it's in Garden City, the, the new one. Uh, I think it's called Fresh. Fresh. Fresh Choice. Fresh Choice. Fresh Choice now can deliver goods to you if you order online. Now, many people will probably start using that. Somebody talked to me the other day about saying, you know, when we watch our rugby and we get really hungry, when we order food, you know, we have to go out and we miss the game. There's an opportunity. You have Uber. You also have uh, Uber Food, I think it's called. Uber Eats. You also have Uber Eats. Uber Eats only specializes in picking up your food for you from the restaurant and delivering it to your house. I know many people in Fiji would like Uber Eats or equivalent of. But there are many opportunities in that. I'm not saying you're introducing Uber in Fiji. Please don't misquote me. But I'm saying there are opportunities in that respect. Now, same way, we believe companies like TFL need to restructure themselves, re need to reorientate themselves. TFL, of course, used to provide landline communications. But TFL now is the largest owner of the largest network of fiber optic cable in, in Fiji. Hardware infrastructure, they have there. So they now need to get into being a landlord of that and opening up that infrastructure for competition among service providers. So TFL should not be competing with Digicel or Vodafone, but TFL, in, but TFL should be allowing the infrastructure at a price to be used by Vodafone and Digicel, because their business model is their different business focus. And I think there's currently some, um, some tension in that area. And I think TFL needs to really look at this business model, which we're trying to impress upon them. So again, you know, when I'm talking about remodeling, uh, those of you in the room, of course, you all come from IT background. You also need to really look at your own businesses. You need to look at the capacity in your organizations. Do you have the right people? We, for example, uh, you know, there's a number of call centers that have been set up. Uh, data centers have been set up, back-end processing, and we are very much focused as a government on encouraging the growth in that area. But do we have enough courses available at FMU or USP in terms of courses that look at managing those types of businesses? And I don't think there is any at the moment, where you actually, there are specific courses developed overseas for the management of these types of centers. So I was talking to somebody who set up a uh, call center back-end processing, he said, I still have to bring in people from Australia to do the management, carry out the management of this particular organization, because there's nobody here with that skill set. They would rather hire a local to do that because less cost for them. So similarly, we need to be able to be more responsive and think ahead. The, the thing about technology, of course, is very fast, it's very quick. I just saw a video clip the other day how in Sweden now they're putting a chip, it's only about this big, over here. They in fact have cocktail parties where you can go and for 100 euros you get a chip put in your, in your wrist or just above your wrist. And I go and I um, pay for my um, train, I open my door, I go into my ATM machine, I just put my hand. And I was saying to somebody, you know, the danger of course is, I wonder if they've got some, you know, security features, but if somebody chops off my hand and uses my hand to open things. It's a reality. You see movies happening. But my, my point is that it's really taken off. But with every new technology, there is also, you need to have security features built into it. You need to have laws around it. Um, I'll, I'll try and finish off very quickly, uh, but I wanted to also highlight that the government has put in place a number of incentives. Uh, we have, as you know, for the Youth Entrepreneurship Scheme, 
we've now opened it up. It applies to those over the age of 40 uh, who can access up to $30,000. Uh, they don't necessarily have to have a university degree. We have uh, tax incentives for people who have startups uh, in the ICT area, 150% tax deduction. And of course, if you uh, start up a company in the ICT area uh, with minimum levels of investment, you get tax holidays up to, up to seven years. Um, and we've also, in terms of the incentives that's available, we've widened the definition of, of ICT. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, wanted to also just very quickly uh, highlight uh, to you that uh, it, it is a wonderful opportunity for all of us. Uh, whenever there is a usage of uh, introduction of new technology, there will always be a transition phase. Uh, people need to look at the bigger picture. They need to look at the end goal. Uh, for example, when e-ticketing was introduced, you know, uh, people were saying, well, we should not do this. Uh, this is Fiji. Uh, we should have cash system and e-ticketing at the same time. If you introduce tomorrow a cash system, how many people use e-ticketing? That's the reality. There will be a transition stage. When Australia introduced e-ticketing, they had problems for a couple of years. But the reality is that you need to look at your risk. With any program, any new project, there will be some variance. There will be a smaller percentage or a percentage where you will have issues. But the trick is, how do you manage those risks? What is your response to those risks? So that is very, very important for us to be able to understand. I had a meeting with the new CEO of LTA yesterday and he's thinking of you know, using the e-ticketing card services up to a newer level. Getting that to be a payment system uh, for those people who come and use LTA services. He's very keen to have many LTA services available online and have the payments by using e-ticketing. So again there's a bigger scope for that. And I wanted to also say that, uh, you know, we've uh, put in place a number of initiatives. Uh, we want to, of course, work with you. Uh, most of you, you know, look, uh, obviously look like uh, managers in your respective areas or people who uh, are in positions to make decisions. We have to invest in our people. It's very critical. I have a, you know, four-year-old son who actually can get into YouTube and do all sorts of funny things. I have to control it. Our minds weren't like that when I was a kid. Young people have a much greater capacity to absorb technological changes. And we must try and harness that. And we must also be able to identify people who can take us forward in that respect. Government is very keen to develop, develop capacity. We're going to have internships. We'll be also officially rolling, rolling, writing out to all the universities again through the OMRS unit to get more and more people into that space. More and more technology will be used. Mobile phone companies, your TFLs, need to understand that people are very hungry for the new technology. You can't simply say, well, because I've got this much of a bandwidth, it'll be okay. The moment you introduce new services, people completely absorb or consume that, I should say, very quickly. And remember one thing, people with technology People forget what we were like only a few years ago. I remember as a kid, when Muhammad Ali used to have these boxing matches with George Foreman and others, it was a big deal for us when I could go and watch the fight one week after the fight took place. At the, you know, the cinemas, I used to go with my father to watch this fight. It was like a big deal. My God, it's only been one week and we're watching the fight. Now, if people don't see it live, they moan about it. It's a fact. Today, we've been introduced watching television on your phones. When it freezes for a few seconds, people complain about it. They don't forget. They forget the fact that last year they weren't able to watch this on their phones. That's the nature of this technology. It basically also tells us that we need to ensure that we are on top of the game. And you as leaders in the ICT area need to be able to be the ambassadors. So whenever new change is introduced, you are able to tell people around you and the community around you that this is what we need to do. Otherwise we will get left behind. 
And technology, if put to the right use, can be a fantastic tool. I have not touched upon areas of medicine, transportation, various other areas where we can bring about very positive changes, enormous positive changes. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank uh, FNU uh, for organizing this. I also have to tell you that uh, as a government, we'll be calling in all the different companies uh, very soon um, to talk about some of the uh, capacity issues that may exist. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities for us in getting creating more jobs in the ITC space, in the services sector overall, but the ICT space, we've got some ideas and plans in that respect. I understand there's a small company in Latoka, for example, at the moment. There's about four or five people that are filing tax returns for Australians. Now, they're higher paying jobs. We have accountants in Fiji who are CPA compliant, CPA certification. If we are able to get that opportunity, we'll create hundreds of jobs, high end paying jobs. So don't look at ICT as far as business as just as somebody sitting and doing calls, you know, answering calls or making phone calls. I'd like to thank once again FNU for this. And let's put our hands together and uh, heads together to see what better solutions we can come up with. It is very critically important that with technology also, we are mindful of how people can use technology to infiltrate our security, our national security, get access to information that we need to be very mindful of. And this is why it's critically important, the government's initiatives, for example, signing up to the Budapest Convention and having CERT put in place, and needs to be given the full support and indeed the mandate. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very good morning. Good night.